1963 Ford Galaxy 500. Someday you will be mine. Oh, yes. The night that the light might inspire to leave are the stars that could fill a whole galaxy. The stars we see, far from Mars they be, they can be like me and drop bars and leave. This is a car for every legendary Saturday dad. To understand the Ford Galaxy, you have to understand the Fairlane. To understand the Fairlane, you have to understand the Falcon. Falcon, entry level. Yep, this is for getting your foot into the door. Welcome to the Ford family. Oh, those wedding bells are ringing. Now we're at the Fairlane. Mid-sized. It's a stretched and widened Falcon, really. Uh, same stuff, just more room, because your kids, they're not babies anymore. Galaxy. Your kids are now driving age. Bequeath them the old Fairlane, because your galactic dad throne awaits. A convertible family car? Sure, you deserve it. You upgraded from a ranch house in Levittown to a four-bedroom, three-story house out in Parksburg. The Ford Galaxy was available as a four-door hardtop, four-door wagon, two-door hardtop, two-door hardtop fastback, and a two-door softtop, which is what this is. Your engine choices were everything. Whatever you want, have it. You should have your Galaxy how you like it. I've seen 223 cubic inch inline six mileage makers, as they call them, with one barrel carburetors to 427 V8s with four barrels, all in these cars. You could have it as automatic, you could have it as manual, you could have it as column shift, you could have them as floor shift, and any rear gear sets you want. Trim levels were a new thing in 1963. And this is a, the number means nothing. It, it means you get some trim and a radio and I think softer seats. It has nothing to do with the engine. Because this 1963 Galaxy started life with the 223i6, but uh, it was swapped sometime in its history for a period correct 390 cubic inch or 6.4 liter FE V8 with a four holer intake and four bow carburetor. The new old stock 390 badging was also added. Horsepower numbers are always vague pre-smog, but you can expect a 390 cubic inch uh, with a four barrel to make 265 horsepower at about 4,100 RPM and 378 foot-pounds of torque at 2,400 RPM. Uh, this transmission was also swapped from the Ford Cruisomatic three-speed automatic to one of the crispest Borg Warner T10 four on the floor manuals I've ever felt. Now fourth gear is not an overdrive and the rear end ratio is 350 or you know 3.5. Uh, which means this chonky 6.4 liter iron V8 is turning a fast for its size 2,500 RPM at 60 miles an hour. So, you know, 70 miles an hour on the turnpike, I don't know. Uh, that's going to be stressing this old engine. You could go lower on the rear end to like a 320 or maybe even 308 gearing. The 390 FE could handle it. It has diesel level torque, but that would make the Galaxy a, an old dog off the line. Because what's the red line for a 390 FE? 4,900, 5,100 RPM? I, there's no rev limiter because there's no computer. Uh, uh, if this had the base two barrel carb and intake, the engine would probably AFR choke before you would float the valve. So you could just, you just put your foot on the floor into the engine, just, you know, gassed out. The Ford 390 cubic inch uh, FE was one of the most widely used V8s in Ford's inventory in the 1960s after the 289 Windsor. The FE, or it stands for Ford Edsel uh, V8s, are older and less advanced than the small block Windsors. Fight me. FE blocks do perform. And the Mythic 427 in the 60s was a Ford FE engine. But the FEs, they're, they're inefficient mastodons. I mean, you can young them up with EFI tech, Protronics ignition, trick flow cams, long tube headers. But it's all CGI on De Niro and Pesci. But what about the 427 Cobra? Okay, that's different. A 427 Cobra is built from the crank to the rockers to win races. A 427 is old, 
but it's Vince McMahon old. You don't stay that way without the right gear. And speaking of gear, these aren't stock wheels. They are wheel ventiques, same as my Falcon. No power steering. Whoever ordered this car new in 1963 wanted a convertible in 500, you know, series trim uh, with manual steering. Manual steering isn't a problem in my little Falcon, but in a four and a half thousand pound Galaxy, y- you're working. Underneath, Galaxies used what Ford called the X-frame. It's, it's two cross members to replace structure lost from the absent roof. And credit to Ford, it works. Dr- drive a Galaxy. It isn't floppy or Bodie, but it's, a, it's still a heavy, long car, and those tires will sing. But driving a drop-top Galaxy in traffic around Pittsburgh was carefree, is the right word. People around us were agitated from their jobs or the layers of stress from the troubled 20s. But we were just cruising. It, it's 3.10 p.m. on a Friday. And we already have all of our homework finished. Nothing to do but watch the city go by in panovision. Oops, sorry about that. I need some U.S. Gary Bonds or, or James Brown's Say It Loud album or, or Glass Houses or hell, License to Ill. It all works. Subdivisions doesn't. I mean, you could blast word of mouth in a 1963 galaxy and it would fit because the visual lines of a galaxy are just so simple. They welcome your own interpretation. Just two straight lines of trim running from stem to stern. Quad headlights silently bisecting the hood gap, balanced by quarter fins, and tied together by the lettering of Ford space wide across the hood. The rear quarter bulges, molds seamlessly into afterburner-esque taillights. And that's it. I mean, you have these fake vents that are just as clownish today as they were in 1960, but the rest of the car's visuals are you, are up to you. They're you. The rest of the car visual is you. The car shows you off. A galaxy showcases the humans inside of it as much or even more than itself. 1963 Ford Galaxy convertible. It's a blue sundress paired with Wayfarers and Chucks or a a blue polo shirt, tan slacks and a silver wristwatch. Relentlessly timeless. And the owner, Nicholas here, is owning the look with side slicked hair, a vertical stripe button down shirt, straight out of Mad Men. I mean, I didn't want this day to end. Just, just let me cruise Pittsburgh until the sun sets. I'll fill the tank. A galaxy is as pleasurable as any vice because like gin martinis, American cheese, and a two hour RP session, there's a price to pay. And I'm not talking about a hangover or weight gain or a overcranked dick. I'm, I'm talking about contextual guilt because this car predates the Civil Rights Act. I mean, when this car was new, LGBTQ and allies had to meet in secret. Domestic abuse was a family issue in 1963. And think about whoever bought this car new that year. You know, they'd be cruising away from the dealership in their new convertible galaxy, feeling so fine. Then boom, JFK is gone. Can you enjoy a car outside of the horrid world in which it originally drove? Do you feel it's permissible for me to drive a galaxy and pretend I'm in 1963, but only the happy parts? Is that fair? Can a car transcend time? Where do you stand on transcendentalism, one of USA's unique philosophies? It began approximately in 1830, 30 years before the Civil War. Transcendentalism says that by drinking in your immediate world through your five senses, you learn a grander truth about the world at large. Sounds kind of hippie-ish, right? Yeah, well... It's what allows a back porch philosopher from Friedensburg to claim to know what it's like in Philly, even though the only time they leave Schuylkill County is to go to the King of Prussia Mall. And it's what allows me, someone born in 1981, to act like I know what the 1960s were like, even though all I did was look, sniff, sit, and operate a consumer product from 1963. Transcendentalism denies institution. 
You don't need to, it, it says you don't need to be an expert to understand something. It says immediate indirect experience is enough. Class, we would start with Emerson, who was the father of transcendentalism in the 1800s, but he didn't really write fun things. All he did was give speeches at universities and churches that boiled down to, you ought to be ashamed, and I'm really smart. Thoreau, on the other hand, was entertaining. He was a deadbeat and a hypocritical sloth, but he had some fun points. So let's look at him again, and we're skipping right to the end because I'm not testing you on this. Uh, this bit is from the conclusion chapter, and I'm going to give it to you twice, uh, once with some uh, clarification as we go through it, and then I'll read it to you again. I learned this, at least by my experiment which means living out in the woods in a cabin by Walden Pond, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will be met with a success unexpected in common hours. Common hours, meaning your success will be something you can't imagine when you're awake. He will put some things behind, meaning you're going to abandon past beliefs and ideas on how the world works. He will pass an invisible boundary new, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him, or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense. Now, liberal is being used as an adjective in this case, meaning generous. There was no liberal political party to adopt that word as a noun in 1853 when Thoreau was writing this. And he will live with the license of a higher order of beings. One more time. One more time with one word change to make it more personable for you. I learned this, at least by my experiment, that if you advance confidently in the direction of your dreams and endeavor to live the life which you imagined, you will be met with a success unexpected in common hours. You will put some things behind and you will pass an invisible boundary, new, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within you, or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in your favor in a more liberal sense, and you will live with the license of a higher order of beings. Sounds a little no duh today, but it's still a radical statement. You will put some things behind. Now, can you or I put behind all the injustice of the 1960s and enjoy this car. Can I interpret this car in a more liberal sense? That decade was a problematic time, but it's idealized because in a very anti-transcendentalist way, institutions could serve as a source of comfort, at least every bit as much as a source of rebellion. For many, those institutions represented dependable, lifelong work. So that a guy gets a job in a factory at 23, and he's not worrying about the whatever thing he's making becoming obsolete within his lifetime. He's also not worried about the ability of that factory job to pay off his house, or fill the stomachs of his three kids, or keep his wife comfortably seated in a Ford Galaxy. But the problems come less from what we idealize about that time and more about what's ignored, such as the lack of rights for all sorts of marginalized groups. And you could defend that era by simply saying, well, it was just the attitude of the time. And maybe that's true. We were taught about oppression in history classes and reminded that even though America created its identity as a beacon on the hill, we aren't exactly perfect either. I mean, no country or no company and no person is. But to what extent can context protect something from criticism? It's a valid question that I don't know the answer to because if you criticize one thing, it opens holes to other things that ought to be criticized as well, lest you get labeled a hypocrite. Let's cancel the General Lee, but... Let's drive Mustangs, even though Henry Ford was a racist. Henry Ford was a homophobic, racist, Nazi sympathizer. But I love what they created. So, context is important. And I think cancel culture is mostly an excuse for people to avoid having to engage 
with context in a way that makes them uncomfortable. Because we don't live in that ideal world where things that are unacceptable today have always been. There was no moral authority to police the actions of what people found funny, what people found cool, what decals people wanted to put on their cars, what brands they wanted to support. And that moral authority doesn't exist today, no matter how much social media wants to believe it occupies that role. They only succeed for as far as the person or company cares about the backlash. J.K. Rowling already made her money. And you can't do shit to Dave Chappelle. The person or company or the advertisers have to care enough to want to avoid the heat because it'll cost them more money in the long run. But some have enough money to recognize that, in some cases, it's just a temporary storm. And if they're able to weather it, they'll be better off. Tiger blood. This isn't to defend bad behavior or discourage people from speaking out against it, but rather to advocate for grayscale. That actions committed in bad taste don't automatically equate with actions committed in bad faith. Can you divorce the Ford Galaxy from its historical context any more than the General Lee from its design? I don't know. It's easy for me to write off the General Lee. And the Dukes of Hazard to me, was just this corny show on in the middle of the day before cartoons, and it had one car jump and the rest of the show was boring. Doesn't really affect me. So whatever. Get rid of it. I don't care. But here's a car that I do like, and I'm still struggling with its context. The policies of the company that create it, and the personal politics of the executives. But when I sit inside of it, when I drove it, I felt happy. I felt like I was rewriting a bad time and putting my own revisionist spin upon it. And by shoving this Cold War design through 20th century air, I am separating the artist from the artwork. I suppose it all comes down to individual values. I still want one. I will own one someday. Convertible only. I have to rewrite my own ending to the Ford Galaxy story. In context will change with time till we own what we know.